Thank you. It's nice to be here with you today. I have the opportunity this morning to talk to you a little bit about crucial conversations. Now, this is one of those talk topics that everyone kind of hears and says, wow, crucial conversations, what's that? Well, let me give you a little description of what we'll talk about today. And one of the sessions that I was conducting as I was getting ready for the session, preparing the room and so forth, one of the participants arrived a little early. His name was Brian. As he put his materials down, he looked up, he saw me across the room, made eye contact, and he pointed at me and he said, are you going to be able to help me? <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know, right? what are you dealing with? And as we started to talk a little bit, found out that he had an employee who was incompetent, socially and technically. He went on to describe in detail some of the problems that he was experiencing. He said, this person has so many problems with his teammates that people are leaving our team, moving to other places in the organization. He said, that's complicated by the fact that we need to interact with other teams within the organization. And other teams work around us, if they can, so that they don't have to interact with this individual. He said, then there's the technical side. He said, he is so bad at his job, we have to double and triple check his work to make sure we catch all the errors. And, and even then, we don't catch everything. It's hard to assign them to any project that's going to go to an end user because we can't catch all the problems that he'll create. So Brian had been documenting this person's performance over the last little while. And he went to his boss, a vice president in the organization, and laid out his case, wanted to let this person go. The vice president carefully considered, listened to the arguments, listened to the experiences that Brian had had. Then finally he said, you know, I think we should give this person a clean slate and let him start over. Now put yourself in Brian's position for a moment. He knows that this is absolutely the wrong decision to make, that this person is creating all kinds of problems for him back at his home office. So he musters up all the courage he can. He looks his boss straight in the eyes and he says, okay, that'd be fine. <laughs> and he walks away. How does Brian feel at this moment? Dejected, frustrated, upset, trying to think about how he's going to deal with this individual and with this decision that's been made. If you've ever been in this kind of situation, you'll appreciate the ability to talk through high-stakes disagreements. These are crucial conversations. They're things that we run into at home, at work, in the community. We run into them week after week. And our ability to handle these and do so well differentiates us in important ways. Now, I know a lot of you are sitting there thinking, well, the big problem here with Brian is that it was Brian and not me. <laughs> Removed from the situation, we often think that we'll handle it better than when placed in the situation. When we're placed in these situations, when we're actually facing these high-stakes disagreements, something interesting happens. Adrenaline starts to spill into our blood. Now, what's the purpose of adrenaline? Right? Fight or flight, which is really good if we're facing a predator or a physical threat. Not very good if we're facing an emotional, a psychological threat. So adrenaline spills into our blood, and it prepares us for flight or flight. What does that mean? That means that blood is reallocated to the large muscle groups. Is the brain a large muscle group? It turns out... No. <laughs> right? And the resources have to come from somewhere. It ends up that the higher reasoning functions of our brains tend to shut down. So we are less able to handle these high stakes disagreements in the moment. So a lot of those times when you're walking away from a crucial conversation and saying, oh man, I was such an idiot. Clinically, you were. Right? You were less able to deal with these high stakes situations. Here's the sad truth. What you find is that for 23 hours during the day, you're reasonable, you're rational, you're decent, you're able to handle multiple problems as they come up, solve issues, right? address concerns. 23 hours of the day, this is you. But if this is you normally, if this is your brain normally, this would be your brain on a crucial conversation. 
right? When it matters most, we're likely to do our worst. The other sad aspect of this is that no one is immune. Now, I've brought with me a little example of a crucial conversation. Let me read it here to you. Typical day. Shut up. No, you little wimp. You get out of that room where I'm going to tell. Fruitcake. <laughs> now, you might be guessing where I got this from. It sounds like something that might happen at home. Right? I've got three boys at my home. So this sounds like something that might have come from my house. Well, it is a house example, but it's not my house. This was from the U.S. House of Representatives, <clears throat> as reported in USA Today 2003 from one of the most powerful committees in the House, the House Ways and Means Committee. Right? And these are people we elect because they're supposed to be good at this. When it matters most, when things are on the line, when it's high stakes, we tend to do our worst. Now, it's not all bad news. We've actually, over the last number of years, been watching people in these types of high-stakes situations, dealing with crucial conversations. Think, how do they manage this? What do they do differently when they get through them and do so brilliantly? Those who are especially skilled interpersonally. We found that they adhere to a number of different principles and skills. Best practice principles and skills. Now, we don't have time here today to go into all of these, but I want to share with you one of the keys to be effective in these crucial conversations. So we're going to look at a little aspect we call Master My Stories and describe in a little more detail here what we refer to as the path to action. Right? Path to action. So here's the big problem that we're going to be wrestling with. That so many times we talk ourselves out of holding a crucial conversation that deep down we really know we probably should hold for a lot of different reasons. It's with our boss. It's with a very powerful colleague. It's a touchy or sensitive subject. People aren't going to change anyway. This isn't going to do any good. All the reasons that go through our head. The solution here that we want to present to you is to learn how to create emotions that help you actually want to get back to dialogue. And so often, in the heat of the moment, you can almost feel those strong emotions start to kick in. And when it matters most, we're least likely to do our best. How do we manage those emotions in a way that helps us want to get back to healthy dialogue? So let me describe to you here what we call the path to action. Path to action. Fairly simple. We see and hear, we tell ourselves a story. That generates a feeling, which then drives an action. This became very apparent to us as we were working one day in the healthcare industry. We found a young nurse who was describing one of her first days on the job. She was full of enthusiasm, ready to work, right, ready to serve. She was in the business because she wanted to make a difference with clients, with patients, save lives, right, trying to alleviate some of the suffering that people experience. So she's in this situation. She's looking around. Everyone's moving around. A doctor who typically didn't come down to the floor but was there because he had a patient walks out of a room where there was a sick patient. And he looks around and he sees her over there and he says, you, Come here. She walks over and says, Hi, Dr. So-and-so. My name is... I don't need to know your name. You're not going to be here long enough for me to learn it. I have a patient, however, here who requires some specific attention. I've written down on this piece of paper exactly what needs to be done. No more, no less. Do you think you can handle it? Now put yourself in her position. What's going on in your mind? This is where the path to action comes into play. Let's take a step back and see how it unfolds. The first part of this is that we see, hear, or otherwise observe something. Put yourself in the nurse's position. What was it that she saw, heard, or observed? If you remember back from the story, she's at the post. She sees people walking around. She sees the doctor walk out of the room. And then she gets this treatment, which isn't as professional as she'd expect. Now, it doesn't just stop there. Here's where it gets really kind of interesting. We tell ourselves a story. 
We have biases. We have filters through which we sift this information, these observations. We create a whole scenario. What does this mean about what's going on? What does this mean about me? So what's the story that she might be telling here? A lot of you might imagine. She's telling that story that says, this doctor, he's arrogant, he's rude, he's inconsiderate, and I have a lot of evidence that tells me I'm right because all doctors are that way. Now this story creates the feeling. If that's the story you're telling and you're this nurse, how does that make you feel? Can you almost feel it starting to rise up, that energy, that, that emotion, frustration, dislike? And in that emotional state, we make choices about which actions will lead us to the results that we want. But so often, we fool ourselves into taking actions that lead us away from those results rather than closer to those results. Now, real quick, where do we usually catch ourselves on this path to action? Woo, way over here, right? Where do we, you're saying, how did I get here? We want to have a skill that helps us do two things. One, when we find ourselves way over here, to be able to retrace our path. Get back to the point where we have the highest leverage, which tends to be that story. We don't have control over the observations. We don't feel like we have much control over the feelings. We do have a lot of control over that story that we tell. So if we can get back to that story and take a look at it. This helps us in another way of catching ourselves closer to the time that we're telling our stories so we can avoid some of our worst reactions. So, taking a look at the story. There's three types of story that we tend to tell. The victim, the villain, and the helpless. Sometimes we get all three, the trifecta, right? that help us feel good about acting in ways that we typically wouldn't act. So this victim, villain, helpless story, if we can take a look at it, analyze it, and tell a different story, it can be so powerful. The victim story is where we cast ourselves as innocent bystanders. There's nothing else I could do. It's, it's almost the martyr story. The villain story is the opposite. When we look at others, we make them the sum total of their vices. That they wake up every morning thinking and scheming about ways to make us miserable. And then this helpless story. What else can I do? It's just the way the organization is. That's just our culture. These can be so powerful. I was working with an executive at one point. Now, this executive had some struggles with a colleague on the executive team. His name was Shane, and he had a lot of disagreements with Paul. I'd been asked to coach both of them to see if we could bridge some of the gaps and rifts that had kind of opened up over the course of their relationship. And as we were talking, Shane and I, about the things that he would need to do and how he could repair the damage that had been done, he stopped me in the middle of my conversation. He says, you don't get it. He's no angel. What is he insinuating here? Saying he's no angel, he's kind of the devil. Right? If you knew him, you would know. And it was so powerful to be able to go back and take a look at this story, the villain story start to talk with Shane and say, while it's true that he may be no angel, it's probably true that he's more than a devil. And that there are lots of contributing factors that go into creating this story. Those who don't have power over the story that dominates their life, power to change it, power to deconstruct it, power to modify it as times change, truly become powerless because they can't think new thoughts. The interesting thing here is, first, you control the story. You create it. You give it life. Then, it controls you. What kind of stories are you telling? By shifting how we tell these stories, we can change how that interaction unfolds. What happens as a result? If you're able to grab a hold of these stories really understand where you might be telling a story and fill in the rest of the information, tell a more accurate story, you'll find that you'll move quicker towards your results. You'll have more of a desire because those emotions will be kept at bay. So good luck in your crucial conversations as you go out and start to master those stories. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.